two, check one, two. Good morning, Water's Edge. Good morning, Water's Edge. How's everyone doing? I learned many years ago if you're going to err, err on the side of grace. So graciously just wait and y'all enjoy your fellowship time, which is also always a blessing here at Water's Edge. But we are glad to have everyone here. Another beautiful day God's given us. We thought it might be a little chilly, and it might be a little bit this morning, but once that sun breaks on through here, it's going to be a, a beautiful uh, Sunday morning again that God's given us for Mother's Day, and we're just very grateful for that. So uh, welcome those who are uh, normal folks here every Sunday at Water's Edge. If you're visiting, we're so grateful to have you as well. Grateful for that. And those watching online, grateful to have you watch online also and be a part of our fellowship and our worship time this morning. I wanted to read a, a verse of scripture, actually a, a chapter of scripture, most of it this morning, and just uh, give a shout out to moms. I know our, our country has a day called Mother's Day, and uh, we certainly love moms here at Water's Edge. We love the family. That's a gift by God, by the way. God created the family, and so that's why we love the family, love moms and dads and, and children. Uh, kids rock, uh, but moms rock, and we want to we wanna just recognize moms as, hey, uh, we are grateful for God that he created moms, uh, grateful for uh, you moms that are part of our fellowship, uh, future moms that are here as well, and uh, grandmothers that are here, just so grateful for, for moms. And so I, I thought about this passage of Scripture from Proverbs. It's a very familiar passage of Scripture that you're probably aware of. And I'm going to place uh, the word mom or mother in place of the word wife because they're kind of synonymous in this uh, great uh, proverb. This Proverbs 31 it reads this way, An excellent mother... Who can find? She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing, with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. How about that, uh, David and uh, Brianna, wherever you guys are? It's kind of cool. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. A hard-working working woman. She puts her hands to the, the staff, and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Moms are busy, by the way, <laughs> what I can tell here, and wives. 
Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of her kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. That's a cool word right there. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellent, excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. God, give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. What a, what a wonderful uh, word of wisdom coming from King Solomon, coming from the Proverbs. Uh, King Solomon putting that in his writings uh, that speaks about just the, the blessedness of wives, the blessedness of, of mothers. And so as the scripture says, we should, we should bless moms and honor moms. And so moms this morning, on behalf of the elders and those of us who are gathered here, uh, L you, which means love you. Uh, we love you. Uh, we bless you. We're grateful for you. And, and so we just pray you encourage this day, not just this day, but throughout the year as you uh, live your life, as it says here, in the fear of the Lord, and the reverence of God. Uh, living your life as a mom for the glory of God is uh, so important and so special. And so we're grateful for you this morning. So I want to have a, a word of prayer for the moms. Uh, a couple of the prayer requests I want to add to this prayer for our moms and ask God's grace upon them is uh, uh, Brother Chris, uh, Chris Randall. So we all met Chris. Chris is a uh, kind of a new, a new family been uh, visiting our fellowship, and Chris now works at Ace Hardware. But Chris is out preaching the gospel at another church this morning, and so we're excited about Chris getting that opportunity to proclaim Christ uh, somewhere else here in Lake Country. And so I just want to lift up uh, Chris and that God would bless him and anoint him as he speaks the gospel uh, somewhere here in, uh, in this region <clears throat> at another fellowship. Uh, and then uh, speaking of moms, just want to lift up uh, a word of prayer for uh, Jody. She may be watching this morning. Uh, my wife, who's also a mom, has been uh, uh, struggling with back pain. And she's down again this morning. So we just want to lift her up this morning. We come together as a church family. We uh, pray together, and uh, we believe in prayer that God answers prayers and, and does wonderful things. So I want to lift her up as well uh, collectively this morning. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for just the grace to be here again today and to gather as a church family uh, in your presence. Uh, Lord Jesus, you are the great shepherd of this fellowship, and we acknowledge you as such, and we do so uh, under the glory of God the Father. And uh, Lord Jesus, we know that you have not left us here by ourselves. We have the Holy Spirit with us. Uh, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We know you're, you're here with us, and you dwell within us, and we're two or three or more gathered in your name. Uh, you are here, and you enable us to worship uh, our one true God in spirit and truth, and we are grateful for that. Holy Spirit, we just pause to thank you for, for moms this morning. We we love moms. Uh, we see it's a gift coming from uh, from the one true God, the whole beauty of family. And so, Lord, we, we lift up moms, and uh, we pray a special blessing upon them this morning, a special blessing upon families uh, in, in Lake Country, uh, families uh, in uh, Clarksville, families in the state and in America and across the globe. Father God, moms and dads and family is so important as part of your foundation for, for society. And so we lift it up. But specifically this morning, we ask, God, would you bless the moms and we say thank you for them, the glory of God. Lord, I also just lift up my wife, Jody, who's a mom at, at home and uh, struggling right now with uh, severe back pain and back struggles, Lord. And I just pray by your spirit that you would intervene by your spirit and bring healing to her. And so I lift it up in Jesus' name. Uh, Lord, there's probably others here who are gathered. When we gather, we know there's requests, sometimes spoken, sometimes unspoken. And we believe in the power of prayer at water's edge. And so, Lord, uh, we just lift up uh, everyone in our church family. Uh, unspoken requests that might be here, Lord, as we gather as a church uh, body, that you would, uh, by your Spirit, be at work, working through our crises, working through our difficulties, a sickness, uh, 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 family struggles, Lord, financial dynamics, whatever it might be, Lord, that we, we want to rely upon you. We want to humble ourselves before you, knowing that you will lift us up in your strength and your power. And so we ask that for our whole church family, and specifically on behalf of Jody, I ask that this morning in Jesus' name. And Lord, lastly, I just want to I lift up Chris, uh, how exciting it is, is to see a new family here in Lake Country that loves Jesus, loves the Lord, and feels called to proclaim Christ as, as he gets the opportunity. And so bless uh, Chris and Christine uh, while they're out ministering this morning in another church uh, home somewhere. Uh, may you anoint Chris with uh, just your words of, of clarity and speech that will spotlight Jesus as our great Savior. Uh, the gospel is our great hope, uh, all for the glory of God. And so Lord, we... We appreciate the opportunity to gather. Bless us here on this campus this morning, and we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.
Well, good morning. I want to also express gratitude to God this morning for mothers. Mothers, if it weren't for you, we wouldn't be here today. <laughs> okay, a few correct. of you got it. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, we are grateful to God this morning and his, um, and his sovereign plan and the families that he's placed us in, the mothers that he's given us. We're grateful uh, for that this morning. So we do want to spend a little bit of time this morning sing singing about the great greatness of God, the sovereignty of God. Listen to this verse, Psalm 103, 19 says, The Lord established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. And I'll read that verse first before I read the ones before it, because I want you to see who this God is, what this God is like, and then hear this. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord, this God who loves us from generation to generation has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. So this morning as we sing these first two songs, the sovereignty of God, the love of God, and what a great blessing that this God who is king over all has also seen fit to love us and provide a way for us to have a relationship with him. So let's stand together. You may have a song sheet in your hands if the girls are able to get one to your family. Um, if not, you can find the lyrics this morning as we've been doing the last few weeks on our Water's Edge Facebook page or the email that I sent out earlier this morning. So we're gonna actually going to start down the page a little bit. They're not in the right order. Sorry. Um, with, oh Lord, I lift your name up. Sovereign Lord. And then we'll go into God so loved. your name up. I worship you, my King, for you are the Sovereign I am. Deserving of all glory, all honor and all grace, for you are the Sovereign I am. Let's sing that again. never ends. Sovereign Lord, you created the heavens, yet you call me your friend. Oh Lord, I lift your name up, I worship you, my King, for you are the Sovereign. praise for you are the sovereign I am. Sovereign Lord, the ways are not my own, the wisdom never ends. Sovereign Lord, you created the heavens, yet you call me Oh, Lord, I 
lift your name up. I worship you, my King, for you are the Sovereign I am. Thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, 
Sing to him, sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Oh, may we rejoice this morning in the love that God has shown us. May we rejoice this morning in glorifying God for who he is, for what he's done. Before the world was made, before you spoke it to be, you were the king of kings. Yes, you were. Yes, you were. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. Sing that again. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. Before the world was made, before you spoke it to me, you were the King of Kings. Yes, you were. Yes, you were. And now you're reigning still, enthroned above all things. Angels and saints cry out, we join them as we sing. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God. Glory to God forever. Creator God, you gave me breath so I could praise your great and matchless name. All my days, all my days, so let my whole life be a blazing offering, a life that shouts and sings the greatness of the King. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God. Glory to God forever. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Oh, lift your voices now. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Let us 
have your Bibles, you can turn with me to the Gospel of Acts. And I love, I love referring to most books of the Bible as gospel because it's all good news about the Lord. Somehow, some way, we are in Acts uh, chapter 4 this morning, and we are continuing in our incredible story we looked at last week. And so if you want to follow along with me, you can go to the book of Acts in chapter 4, beginning in verse 23. to get all pinned down up here. Praise God for the wind, though. It's a beautiful day. So I, I saw a story last night on social media that I was really encouraged by, and some of you all who are part of our church family, you may have seen this story as well, and may also have been encouraged. I'm going to try to just paraphrase the story, what I recall of it, and it's from a, a dear brother and sister in Christ that used to be part of uh, Water's Edge. They went here for several years, and then God... Uh, had uh, Brother Randy get a, uh, a promotion to a different uh, power plant. I think he's actually since then moved to another power plant. Uh, but love Randy and Michelle Tedder, part of our church family. And I saw uh, his wife, Michelle, had posted uh, a story that took place, I think, in the past couple of days. And the story is basically this. They uh, had been to a doctor's a visit, doctor's office, because Michelle, uh, remember her in prayer, needs to have uh, shoulder uh, re replacement surgery. And so we want to remember her, uh, lift her up this morning. Uh, but she had, she's needing uh, shoulder uh, replacement surgery. And so they had gone to the doctor somewhere, don't know exactly where. And on the way back, Randy, uh, the good husband that he is, uh, wanted to stop by a gun shop. And uh, <laughs> I don't know how those two things go together. But anyway, uh, she's set for a surgery, and so she asked her prayer about that. And so Lord lift up uh, uh, Michelle in regards to her surgery. Uh, but they come back, uh, I guess, heading back home, and they go to a gun shop, Perry's Gun Shop. Now, I don't know where Perry's Gun Shop is. Anybody here know where Perry's Gun Shop is? Uh, I, I saw, I think it may be like Wendell, North Carolina. Where's Wendell, North Carolina? Anybody know? Wendell. Wendell, North Carolina? Now, there's barbecue there. I've got to figure out where that place is then. And so so they're, they're at Perry's Gun Shop in Wendell, North Carolina, right? And so she goes on to tell the story. There's a, a very tall fella uh, that's inside the gun shop. And if you know Randy, Randy's he's always smiling, just a gracious, kind, uh, uh, easygoing fella. Somehow he kicks up conversation with this very tall fella. And the reason I mention his height, because there's a picture of him uh, in this post, but also says because of his height, somehow Randy uh, used that as a conversation piece, uh, said something about how tall he was, and then somehow that conversation led to talking about Jesus talking about Christ. Now, if you know Randy, that's, that's who Randy is. He always likes to share his faith in some way. Uh, he feels called to evangelism and to, to be uh, bold in sharing his faith, as we shared last Sunday. And so Randy begins to talk with this fellow about the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, ends up this guy's a believer, right? And so they begin to swap stories and tell each other about uh, salvation experiences. And as part of the conversation, this tall guy, whose name is Jonathan, um, he shares with uh, Randy and Michelle how uh, his, his uh, parents uh, came to know the Lord, and I think his maybe sisters came to know, to know the Lord um, through a Billy Graham crusade. It was at a Billy Graham crusade where the gospel was preached, and uh, they responded to the gospel of Christ, uh, gave their life to Christ, and have been walking with Jesus ever since. And so they're swapping all these God stories, right? This is a God-centered testimonial time uh, here at Perry's Gun Shop. And so, so what happened then, Jonathan says, hey, listen, uh, and I don't know how close you are from a, a time... Uh, a time frame regards to if he can attend this or not, but, but Jonathan began to tell Randy about a Bible study that his dad had started and was inviting Randy to this Bible study. And so Randy, I guess, said sure, and so Michelle describes in her post how then, how then uh, Jonathan uh, texted over uh, his phone information to Randy, and so Randy's putting it in his, in his phone, and while he's doing that, Randy has simply asked uh, uh, Jonathan, say, hey, by the way, what's your last name? And uh, and he said, lots. And so Randy said, well, that's, that's interesting. And he, Randy was chuckling, uh, says Michelle. And he says, by the way, you wouldn't happen to be related or know Ann Graham Lots, would you? And he says, yeah, that's my mother. He said, really? And so, so Michelle is just uh, overwhelmed by this, that here they've been talking about Jesus. She said now for about an hour uh, in Perry's gun shop. And, and they were talking about Jesus with the grandson of Billy Graham. And she just found that very cool and very encouraging. 
Now, we know that a name does not make you Christian, just so you know. Uh, a name, uh, just because Billy Graham uh, is well-known in Christendom, if you will, around the world, uh, just knowing the name or being the family chain does not make you a follower of Christ. But here, Jonathan is a, is a follower, a genuine believer in Jesus. He's excited, uh, telling about how his mom actually came to Christ through a Billy Graham crusade. And so Michelle is all encouraged about this. They, they swap numbers, and, it, and Jonathan tells uh, Randy that his father has passed away, but has his Bible study, so he's inviting him to that. And so then, then Jonathan prays for Michelle um, for her upcoming surgery. Remember, she's going to have uh, shoulder surgery. So Jonathan prays for Michelle, and then Randy prays for Jonathan in regards to his dad having passed away. I don't know how long ago that was, and for Anne, Anne and their family. And so, so Randy prays for them. Jonathan prays for, for, for Michelle and Randy. And so basically what took place, what I see is, uh, it's like this prayer and praise time at Perry's Gun Shop. And I thought that was kind of cool, man, just how uh, an impromptu time of prayer and praise uh, at a gun shop. I mean, how, does it get any better than that? I mean, think about it. Roll you with me on this one? I mean, a gun shop, right? Amen. It's like you can pick out a few new guns and pray and praise God at the same time. So how cool is that? And it really flowed out of, as I thought about that, the story, it flowed out of really just them sharing their testimonies. You know, it was, it was a God-centered uh, conversation that led to them sharing testimonies about how, well, my mom came to Christ this way, and they're sharing back for these testimonies and talking about the Lord and praising God and, and getting excited about the Lord, and, and then, and then uh, you know, unfolds. And, and so Michelle shares it, right? And so I, I see the story, and I'm encouraged by the story. I pray you're encouraged by the story as well. We get encouraged by other believers sometimes when we share our story, stories in, in Christ. And it's just kind of it's just kind of neat. It's just kind of fun. It's just kind of it's kind of cool in Christ. Well, you're going to see in the storyline this morning. I think in similar similar ways, just some impromptu prayer and praise that comes out of also just believers sharing their story, sharing what God's doing in their life, what God has done in their life. We, we saw last week in the story of the book of Acts how, you know, Peter and John were bold witnesses for Christ, right? They were bold witnesses for Christ, and we were challenged to, hey, God, help us to be bold witnesses for Christ as well. And so we're back in that same story, but now we get to see what happened on the other side of that story. I can't help but in the moment, uh, a cool testimony in Christ, uh, kind of not quite the same as a cool car that's painted like that, but that's pretty unique over there. Wow, you don't see that every Sunday. You're also not going to see. You're also not going to see what takes place in the story every Sunday as well. It's very unique, <coughs> and it's fascinating. And I believe it comes out of once again, simply sharing one's faith and sharing the story of God, how God's at work in someone's life. And so, I'm going to walk through the story like we did last week, and then we're going to step back and say, you know, there's some cool things inside this story that I think are good for our story in Christ as well as we live out life in Lake Country also. So let me do that. I'm in Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 23. <clears throat> so here we go. Acts 4, beginning in verse 23. And before I jump in, just a little bit of background story to, to bring us up to speed in case you weren't here last Sunday. If you recall, Peter and John... Jesus is gone. He's back to be with God the Father. He's ascended. And he says, now go be my witnesses. The disciples are empowered by the Spirit of God, right? And Peter and John are at the temple. And there's a crippled man. He's asking for provisions, you know, asking for uh, alms, for money to provide for him. And Peter and John say, listen, you know, I don't have any gold or silver. What I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And then he says, rise up and walk. I mean, an incredible, miraculous story took place last week. Because the crippled man who was crippled from birth, he's age 40, is what the scripture tells us, he walks. And, 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 he's, and he's probably, I can see him skipping and jumping around the temple saying, you're not going to believe what happened to you, right? And so the great crowd gathers. Peter and John take the opportunity with the great crowd to not spotlight themselves, to not spotlight the, the miracle, but to spotlight the message. And the message is all about whom? The Messiah whose name is Jesus. We saw that last week. And so they're teaching Jesus, right, to the crowd there in Jerusalem, the same city, the same place where Christ ultimately was crucified, outside the city gates, right? And so this crowd, they're preaching Christ, and if you recall, they preach, yes, the cross, the sacrifice of Jesus, and all that that entails, but then really the, uh, just the, just the, the firming uh, 
life-transforming reality that changes everything, they preach the resurrection of Jesus, right? And so because the tomb is empty and Christ is risen, it changes everything. Well, if you recall, the elders and the religious leaders didn't like that. It's a power struggle. And so they arrest Peter and John, throw them in prison. They're given this chance to have a, a trial, if you will, uh, to be uh, uh, you know, uh, disciplined the next day. But because of the worshipers that's taking place because of this man who was crippled is now alive and people are coming to Christ, people are excited, they cannot really shut down Peter and John completely. They don't choose to crucify him, which they could crucify them, which they could have, if you will, kept in prison, etc. They say, listen, you can go, but you do not preach in the name of Jesus. You do not teach or preach in the name of Jesus wherever you go or else. And so they warn them and let them go. That was last week. So here we are with our story. What's going to happen? What do you think Peter and John are going to do? Where are they going to go? What are they going to say? What are they going to talk about? I think kind of like Michelle, I mean, she could not hold on at Billy Graham's story. What'd she do? She gave it away, right? She passed it on. Reminds me of the song when I was a kid. It only takes a spark to get a fire going. And soon all those around will warm up and it's glowing. We, we take that spark, that, that gospel story, that gospel excitement that God puts in our own spirit, and we, we don't hold on to it. We, we pass it on and see what God will do with it. Well, let's see what happens with Peter and John here in Acts 23, verse 23, chapter 4. It says, When they were released, they went to their friends. Who's that? That's the, that's the body of Christ, right? They went to their brothers and sisters in Christ, the church. So they go to their believers, and it says they reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And so right out of the blocks, we see that Peter and John, they leave, they go to the body of Christ, where they're gathered, and they begin to share, they begin to tell, they begin to testify, they begin to witness. You're not going to believe what happened to us underneath all those religious leaders. We actually were let go, as you can see, we're here with you. And they begin to tell the story about all that God had done and how God had really spared them from being uh, persecuted in regards to you know, public beatings, uh, spared their lives, if you, if you will, what God had done with the crippled man, all that, I believe, is being shared to the body of Christ, the church. And then here's what happened. It says in verse 24, And when they, the friends, the, the people of Christ, heard it, they lifted up their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them who through the mouth of our father David your servant said by the Holy Spirit and I just want to pause there and, and go back just a second so what we see is they gather together and, and, and they begin to share the story and as we share the story and the people hear the story just like we did this morning I think the people are rejoicing and they're all unified and they say man that is awesome what God's doing and it shows a, a unified um, uh, joy a collective gathering here they all begin to say together, God, you, you are sovereign. You, you are in control. And, and, and our, brothers, our brothers here, they were in, uh, held in captivity, and you released them, and the gospel is going out, and this crippled man was healed. People are coming to Christ. And so, men, you are the God of creation. You are God uh, over heaven, over earth. Everything uh, that reigns, you, you, you are supreme. And so they begin to praise God, right? That's what they're doing here. And so as they're praising God, they also then go to the scriptures to search out exactly what is taking place. In their context, God, what exactly you're doing, are you doing here? And so they begin to quote Psalm 2, which is coming from David, as David wrote, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And they quote these words from, from David in Psalm 2. They say, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers set themselves against or were gathered together against the Lord and against the anointed. And so they, they, they go to the scriptures. They, they, they begin to have this incredible shared story time that leads to a, a shared praise about the sovereignty of God. And then they begin to search the scriptures to see, okay, what is taking place in our day and time? Oh, that's right. God, the Holy Spirit, spoke through David uh, years prior to warn us that, that Gentiles and, and, and kings and, and rulers and those in authority would actually rise up against the anointed. And who is the anointed? It's Jesus, the Messiah. And so they go to the scriptures and discern in their own context and their own day and time what's taking place. By the way, that's good application for us as well. If we want to know what's taking place in our own culture, our own day and time, uh, here in America and where God's planted us, and how to understand and respond from a biblical worldview, uh, from an ideology and a philosophy that's centered in Jesus, then we got to go to the scriptures. And that's what they do. 
So they go to the scriptures. And they see all this was prophesied was taking place. For truly in the city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, right? Whom you anointed. And then they mention the names. These are the ones who were gathered against Christ. Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, the peoples of Israel. And then listen to what they say. What, what Luke records that the people realize. To do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And so they go to the scriptures and they realize these things were prophesied in advance. These are all underneath your sovereign control. These were all events that were predestined by you. Uh, these individuals that are listed here, the, the Gentiles, the, the Israelites, the, the, the religious leaders, yes, they are guilty for their own sinfulness and their own actions, but yet somehow all this is under the plans and providence and sovereign will of God. And so we see that what's prophesied is being fulfilled as Jesus said that it would. And we see here for the early church, kind of as a side note, as we work through the story, is that the sovereignty of God was not, uh, I thought about this this morning in this way, imagery for me, the sovereignty of God was not placed upon a, a, a slippery slope of ambiguity for the early church. It's like, well, we believe in the sovereign, sovereignty of God, and it begins to slide down over time with culture and, and understanding of our own uh, human responsibility. So, no, the sovereignty of God is up there because God is up there, and God reigns over heaven, God reigns over earth, God reigns over everything in it. God is God, and he reigns supreme, and he sustains everything under the worship of Christ. And so God's sovereignty is, is a, a critical, foundational, a glorious doctrine of the early church. God is sovereign. Therefore, his plans will be fulfilled. God is in control. And they see that. There's no question mark in their mind. Well, am I more in control in regards to my human responsibility? Yes, we're responsible for our own actions and sins. But yet God is sovereign over those things, working all things together for his good and for his glory. The early church saw that, and they testified that in the scriptures. Well, so where does it go from here? So after they, they search the scriptures, they then ask in a specific prayer, for boldness to speak the name of Jesus. Here's what they say in verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to do what? To continue to speak your word with what? With all boldness. So they're asking God, would you enable us to continue this, this, this witnessing of Christ and this glory of Jesus and seeing what you're doing? And then they say, we'll, we'll continue to speak the boldness while you, speaking of God, you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And so we're going to do our part. We're going to continue to proclaim the gospel, share the gospel, speak about Jesus, and tell people about Christ and how we need to be uh, forgiven of our sins, repent of our sins like Peter's been doing at Pentecost. Uh, and forward, hey, listen, we are guilty for a holy God. We need to repent and get right with God. And, and the blood of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ, it cleanses our sins. And so we place our faith in Jesus. Help us to continue to tell that story. And God, we know you'll do your thing. You'll, you'll do miracles and healings and signs. You'll do those things that testify of this message so people understand the Messiah is, is who he is. He's God. He's God the Son, the resurrected King, whom reigns over all things and all people. And so they pray that prayer. What a, what a, a great prayer to pray. God, would you help us be bold in our faith to continue proclaim the name of Jesus? And then here's how the story ends. Kind of like I was mentioning that, that car. Right? That's a unique car. Listen to this unique ending to the story here in Acts 31, chapter 4. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. The place where they were gathered, we don't know exactly where they were gathered, possibly in that upper room. I don't know how many were gathered. I don't mean, I don't know if they were outside indoors because the, the, the people began to come to Christ in, in massive numbers. And so I don't know how many were gathered together, but the place where they were, somehow it was a little shaking somehow where they, they sensed the, the, the physical reality of it, but it was about the Spirit of God affirming uh, their prayer and affirming uh, God's presence with them. It says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the Word of God with with what? With boldness. With boldness. That's a, that's a pretty cool story, isn't it? That's a, that's a neat uh, historical event that took place in the life of the early church where, where they were in a crisis. They were, they were in a jam. They were in a, they were in a hardship, and, and, and they just wanted to be faithful, and so they were faithful, and, and God sustained them and got them out of the hardship, 
and they came back and they shared their story and they shared their story and they searched the scriptures and, and they talked about the sovereignty of God it led to prayer and it led to praise and had this great time of worship and, and then out of all that God chooses in his sovereign sovereign will just to, to shake the place where they were to just affirm in their spirits that you're on the right track and, and you're blessed and be filled with the Holy Spirit and continue on church continue on to be my witness for, for Christ I love the story so I want to go back now and just say, what are a couple insights or truths that we see in the early church that we can learn from and apply to ourselves as we live out Jesus here in our context here in Lake Country? Well, there's a couple I want to look at this morning, and one of them ties to our opening story about Michelle and Randy. So the first insight is this, is that God, in a sovereignty, God takes our, our Christ-centered and God-centered testimonies, and he can use those to encourage and fuel great worship. God can take our testimonies and does oftentimes our stories about him and he uses those stories to fuel and encourage us in our own worship time. I, I believe the disciples here, they, they were encouraged, right? When Peter and John came back and they probably said, hey, what happened exactly in front of all those rulers and those educational elite and, and the seniority of, of the community, the, the elders? What happened? They, they, could have, they could have killed you like they killed Jesus, but they didn't. And so tell us more, tell us more. And so they began to tell the story. And as they told the story, I believe the people of Christ there were encouraged. I'm here, John and Peter, they, they, they were, if you think about it, uh, men that weren't that bold uh, before the death of Christ. As a matter of fact, we talked about how Peter denied Jesus three times uh, before the, the crucifixion event. And so, and so they weren't necessarily that bold beforehand, but here they're bold now. And so they're proclaiming their, proclaiming their faith. And I'm sure they told the disciples, say, yeah, listen, it was, it was kind of intense. I, I didn't know exactly what I was going to say. And, and I remember the words of Jesus who said, listen, don't worry about what you should speak when you are placed before uh, rulers and kings and authorities because the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. And so I just trusted in the Spirit in the moment. And so when they said, listen, don't you speak in Jesus' name, and, and you're not going to believe this, but you know what I said to those guys? I said, I said listen, I don't know if it's right um, before God to believe you or, 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 or not, but, but all we can do is speak of the things that we have seen and heard. And so in essence, all we're going to do if, as we leave this place is speak and teach and preach Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. And they're, they're probably thinking like, you said what? To Caiaphas? To, to the high priest Annas? To the elders and the scribes who were there? You, you said those words? Man, that had to be spirit-led. To say that kind of boldness in front of those who had the power to lock you up, to beat you, to even probably have you killed with Roman authorities. You, you said that? Yeah, but it wasn't me, just the Holy Spirit. I, I just I just surrendered myself to the Spirit, submitted myself to the Spirit in the moment. He gave me those words to share because that's all we can do, right? He probably encouraged the people there. That's all we can do, right, church? That's all we can do, right, church? Is all we can do is speak that which we have seen and heard. All we can do is speak that which has changed our life. All we can do is speak and, and, and proclaim uh, Jesus because he, he is our King, right? He, he is our Lord. He is our Savior. He has redeemed us. He has, he has cleansed us. He has, he has set us free. He's taken our past. He's washed it. He's made us new. Yeah, all we can do is speak of Jesus. What is before each other? Local setting like this, this that we're more comfortable in, or is before the, the powers to be, the, the president, the, the senate, the con it doesn't matter where or who is before, we can only speak that which has changed our life you've been changed by Christ. And so we speak of Jesus. I believe the disciples were encouraged when they heard these words from Peter and John and I believe it fueled this great worship that we see that took place. And so I praise God for testimonies that speak about the, the power of Christ and the power of the transforming life. So they couldn't hold back. I'm confident they shared these things and how then in one accord the people came together and began to talk about the sovereignty of God, the, the, create, the creative order of God, the great creator, and began to praise and to pray and to give him the glory that's due his name. Church, I believe and we as God's people are touched by the Spirit of God, by the power of Jesus, that we are not to hold on to the testimonies. As I shared this morning, that we are to pass those testimonies on. And as we do, God will bless his church and encourage us in the moment. Now, one thing that we need to get back to at Water's Ed, something we began... I don't know, some 18 years ago, 
that, just so you know, uh, from a pastoral perspective, is very radical in the church, may not be as much today. Uh, I remember the first time I did it in a different fellowship, a different pastorate. Uh, it, it basically was one of the key things that led to my dismissal. I'll leave it at that. Is I, I had the, the testimony of the people, uh, gave the opportunity for the people to testify the goodness of God. I remember I put a microphone down, felt the Spirit of God leading in the moment, say, hey, let's have our people testify about what God's doing. And God's Spirit's moving among folks. And so we put a microphone down, and we knew that God, some stories were coming back about some of our students been away for the weekend and how God was working in their lives. And so we, we, we've got to hear that. Let, that. let that story go out. And so I, I put a microphone down and said, hey, uh, just want to let you all know, we thought God's Spirit's moving us to testify about His goodness. So here's a microphone. We're going to speak, and we're going to have it orally. Certainly, we're going to speak about Jesus. It's going to be God-centered. It's not going to be about us. But here's a microphone. Come and share. And people began to come and share in this context about what God had done in their lives and how uh, what God meant to them and how God was changing their lives and how the Spirit was moving. And so they began to share these things, right? Incredible stories on a Sunday. And then on a Monday, the accusations came in. All that was pre-planned and pre-recorded and those stories were made up and, and that couldn't have happened the way it happened. It was coming from people inside the church. Why is that Why is that possible? Because not everyone inside the body of Christ, the so-called church in regards to name, are followers of Jesus. Are you with me on that? And so it was shutting down that kind of spirit. Well, when Water's Edge was planted, we, from the very beginning, say we're going to testify to God's goodness. And so we don't do it every Sunday as the Spirit leads us, but most, most many Sundays over the course of now 18 years, and we've kind of not done it since we've been outdoors, we need to get back to it. I'm minding by the Spirit of God do it this morning, but we need to get back to sharing our testimony. It's not about us. It's Jesus-centered. It's short. It's brief. But when we give testimonies, what happens? You guys have been with us over the years. You know when we testify of God's goodness, sometimes it leads to incredible worship time. Am I right on that? Yes. Why? Because we get to see God moving in all of our lives in some way. And we're all encouraged by it. And Peter and John went back and they, they passed on the story. They didn't go back and say, hey, Peter, hey, John, what happened to you guys? Oh, it's nothing. Yeah, it's between me and God. You know, my, my faith is private. I, I just want to hold that to myself. I, I don't want to. No, it's just it, it's kind of a, no, it's real tense, you know, and. Let, let them be kind of the drama focused. No, you, you wouldn't have been able to handle it. It was, it was fearful. I could have lost my life. And somehow all the attention goes to him and Peter and John and their story and so forth. And it, and it elevates them. None of that took place. Peter, what happened? I believe, I believe Peter began to share. And then all the people gathered together and said, Wow, God, God, you are so awesome. You reign over all things. We give you praise. And we pray now for all of us that we collectively then can do what? can be that kind of bold witness for Christ in the context you place us in as we move forward. Incredible story. Michelle, she could have held on to her story, right? But she passed it on. She chose a social media platform. Uh, you can use social media in a, a lot of different ways. Yes, it has this negative uh, dynamic as well. We understand that. Uh, it's a culture in which we live. Um, but the reality is we can also use social media, just like we're using uh, Facebook Live right now, to not only share Christ here, but share Christ Whoever listens, wherever they listen, you're welcome. We want you to hear the gospel. You're loved in Christ. You're welcome to come on campus as well. But we use social media for what? For the purposes of the kingdom, to pass on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Michelle passed on her story, and I believe you all were encouraged this morning as I was encouraged to read it, and that's exactly what Peter and John did as well. When we have testimonies about the goodness of God, we're not to hold on to them, but to pass them along. Well, another insight, and I'll... I'll, I'll I'll collapse two together this morning that I want to see in regards to what took place with Peter and John, and it's this. When, when we share our faith, right, when we share our, our stories in Christ, the reality is that persecution or opposition may come our way. Now, for Peter and John, they shared their story, and they're with believers and there wasn't persecution, obviously, among believers. It encouraged them, right? When Michelle shared her story uh, about Randy and Jonathan uh, Lotz, um, I don't think there was any persecution involved. It was actually a good, joyful day in the gun shop, and, and so praise God for that. But the reality is sometimes when we share our faith and we talk about Jesus with others in, in different contexts, it can bring persecution. But here's the other insight that I see. You know, Peter and John shared their faith with that crippled man, and it led to be them being thrown in prison, but then also the other side of that is when we share a faith, we need to understand and be hopeful that God, who is sovereign, reigns over our circumstances. Are you with me? We're on the team of Christ. We're on the team of Jesus. And so it's going to be okay. 
we can share our faith. Sometimes persecution may come, and that's all right if it does, because Jesus is with us. And so we see that, that Peter and John, they were in the face of opposition, and they shared their faith. Then they look, looked at the Scriptures, and they saw in verse 25 and 26 where it said, Against the Lord and against the Christ, these people have gathered together against you. They, they knew that there would be people that would gather against their message and against this this belief in Christ. And so they saw it in the scriptures. They talked about that and they shared that through Dr. Luke. And so the reality is for us also, just like Peter and John, we may face opposition, we may face hardship, trials, uh, suffering. Uh, it'll be a part of the Christian life. And, and it'll also be a part of the life of non-believers. But the difference between a, a non-believer and for believers, when suffering or hardship comes, obviously a non-believer is not going to be uh, persecuted for their faith in Christ because they don't believe. Uh, but with any kind of hardship that comes in life, or specifically for sharing our faith and persecution comes, the hope for us is that we have the sovereignty of God. We, we have the hope in Christ. Uh, we have Jesus as our King who leads us, and the Spirit of God within us who, who guides us and leads us to walk through hardships and trials. If you're wondering where some of the ladies went this morning, I felt led by the Spirit. It was the right timing to have some ladies go and pray for my wife, uh, Jody, who's suffering in back pain and is very down this morning. And so it's the Spirit of God that says, you know, we, we, need, to, we need to have some moms there with that mom to pray. And so, and so they're doing that. That's just a, a physical illness. Um, sometimes there's spiritual dynamics tied with the physical, but whatever's causing it, it it's hard, it's difficult, um, it, it's, it's discouraging, it can bring one down. But here's our hope in Christ, is we have Jesus on our side, right? Amen. So we send believers in Jesus, just like Peter and John came back and spoke to other believers, and we send believers to be a believers to do what? To pray and ask God's blessing, because God is sovereign. And so we pray for God to sovereignly play out your will, whatever that looks like, because your plan's cannot be thwarted because you're God. It changes everything. That's what we have. That's the hope we have. I don't know if you're gathered here this morning you've got some kind of crisis uh, in your marriage uh, or in your business uh, or just personally you're, you're in turmoil and you're struggling or, or, or maybe as a mom, maybe as a grandmother, uh, maybe uh, one of the challenges might be is that our hope is that God loves us. And God has redeemed us through Christ, and he, and he put His Spirit within us. And so we can live in the midst of difficult seasons, and in those difficult seasons, God can bring and will bring glory to His name through those. And if we are in Christ, that's our desire. Are you with me? That is our hope, that God be glorified. And when God is glorified in the midst of our trials, we receive joy out of that. Our joy, but most importantly, His glory. Well... God is sovereign, and Peter and John knew this. And so they speak about the sovereignty of God and the, the goodness of God and how God reigns over all things and how His hand is purposing those things will take place. And so uh, that's in the Scripture. If you go back and read, it's hard for me to, to keep the, the notes uh, clear uh, with the wind, but you can see that in chapter 4 where they knew that the exact things that were playing out were destined and planned by, by, by God. Even though the circumstance was, was larger than them, they were not without hope. I remember years ago, it was uh, my first mission trip outside of the States. I was really, in many ways, a babe in Christ. Uh, but I, God had put in my a spirit a desire to want to take the gospel to wherever he would send me. And so uh, in a seminary class, they said, hey, we're going to Bangladesh this summer. If you want to go, here's the details. And I thought, man, I, I want to go. And, and little did I know what I was getting myself into. And so, so my first mission trip that summer signed up to go, and we we get to uh, to Dhaka, uh, Bangladesh or Bangladesh, now you might pronounce it. But we're in the capital city, and I remember coming off the the uh, the airplane in the terminal and going out of the terminal. I, I, it was uh, it was just complete overwhelming culture shock, uh, as people were yelling and, and uh, at us, what seemed like be yelling at us, want, wanting to touch us, wanting to get things from us, and begging of us and so forth. And so I'd never experienced that. Uh, in the states, and so it was culture shock uh, right from the get go. And uh, God, well, this is kind of intense. This is kind of scary in some respects. And so, but you, you got us here for a reason. And so we made it to our hotel on the outside of the capital city, Dhaka, a major city in, in Bangladesh. And we're in a hotel. And the next morning, they're going to split our teams up in different parts all over the country. And so the next morning arises, and I've got a group. We're going to the northern Bangladesh. Some people are going to southern Bangladesh. 
to get, give you kind of a, a, a feel for the intensity of things that we learned over the course of the, of the two weeks we were there, is, is that in southern Bangladesh, the team that went there had discovered that Osama bin Laden, this is back in 1997, Osama bin Laden had a, a military training camp uh, close to where they were staying, and, and they thought the room was being bugged and so forth and overseen by the local police, and so you kind of get the feel for the intensity. I realized what we got ourselves into. Well, we're, we're in the hotel uh, on the outskirts of the city that morning uh, before we are transported to different parts of the country and we're ready to go, and then the leader who uh, lived there in Bangladesh comes into our hotel room and says, hey, you guys need to sit tight and just begin to pray. And we said, okay, pray, pray about what? They said, well, the, the local authorities uh, here in the city have come and they've taken our passports. And we have our passports and we don't know what's going to unfold. Uh, we have no idea what's going to unfold. And so we just need to be praying. They didn't give us many more details, just pray. Well, when you don't have details, usually your mind can race a lot, right? So we're in a foreign land, uh, borders India, a Muslim country, a, a, a Hindu country. Uh, we know there's been persecution against Christians throughout the country. And so here they have our passports, not letting us out of the hotel. And so we just began to pray. Well, it was kind of intense, intense focused prayer time, if you might. Don't know if we're going to be, you know, locked up, imprisoned, uh, not be able to get out of the country. And so it was challenging. Well, we prayed for a couple hours, and then by God's grace, uh, they came back in and shared with us that that we had been released. They laid, they gave us back our passports, and therefore the teams could break up and, and scatter throughout the country, which we did. And so we get on the bus, and we're scattering north, and you can just imagine the relief over our team. About 10 of us in our bus is like, man, thank, thank you, God. I don't know what's going to happen there, and that was kind of intense and kind of scary, but you had this fear in your mind. And as we get on the bus, we're traveling to northern uh, Bangladesh, about a 10-hour bus ride, 8 to 10 hours. And the bus driver has music on, and the music is so loud. I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like screaming in your ears. And it's other culture. I'm sure if I was raised there, I would probably appreciate the music. But in the fear of almost having you thought we were getting arrested uh, in the city, the capital city, and all the else, all the things else going on, the music was just not comforting to my spirit. And, and I began to wonder if, it, if it's Islamic music. It seemed to be demonic to me. It just wasn't encouraging. Uh, I was getting a little bit fearful in my spirit. And then one of our guys that was with our team had brought some music. And someone said, hey, why don't you ask him if he'll play one of our CDs, right? And so he, he slipped over, I don't know if it was a CD or tape back then, 97, um, but he gave him a tape or a CD, and the bus driver couldn't speak English, but he taped that, took that tape and CD, and he took out his music, and was like, oh, we can hear for a moment, and he placed in our music, and I don't know if he thought he's going to get, you know, uh, uh, you know, music from American culture like Madonna or something, but instead he got music that was all about the Messiah, all about Jesus, all about the, the great and goodness of God. You know, our God is a great, great God, and so... They began to play that music, and he also played it very, very loud, uh, just like his own music. And so we're jamming. I mean, literally jamming uh, as loud as you can possibly think of and, and, and still, you know, uh, think. Um, up the highway to northern Bangladesh, this long trip, listen to praise music all about our great God and our great Savior. And I just think, you know, that story um, reminds me of how when, when they came and said, hey, they've got your passports, and we were asked to pray. The situation really was above us, right? It was beyond us, out of our control, nothing we could do. Same thing for Peter and John. The situation was above them, out of their control, nothing they could do. But when you find yourself in situations that are above us and out of our control, you go to the one who is above the situation, right? And the one who's above the situation is our sovereign God. Our sovereign God and our sovereign Lord reigns. And so we go to Him. We go to the one who's above the circumstances, who's above the situations, who's above the crises, who's above the difficult days, right? Who's above all things, and in Him we have our hope. And God brings praise and blessing in the midst of it. He did that for John and Peter. He did it for us on our trip. He can do it for you today as well. Moms, maybe you're having a struggling day today. It's supposed to be a great day for moms. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe you're having hardships, and, and the situation seems so above you and so beyond you. Well, guess who's above the situation, God is. God reigns supreme and He loves you. That's been determined through Christ on the cross, His death, burial, and resurrection. And so I love to think about how, as we share our stories, yes, times may be difficult, difficult, persecution may come, but the reality is we have a great God and we can trust in Him. And out of the difficulties, He will bring glory to His name. Well, one last thought coming from Peter and John that I want to, I want to just highlight here for a second is that is that they prayed, right? They prayed, God, would you give us boldness? And, and, and they wanted to have this boldness in order to share Christ. 
And God answers their prayers. Uh, the shaking is really the answering of their prayers. And so God answers prayers that are prayed, I believe, according to his will. And we see that in the church, is that they prayed in accordance with God's will. And how do we know that? Because they prayed that they would have the power to share their faith. So let me ask you, do you think it was God's will for the disciples to begin and continue to share their faith in Christ? Well, yes. Jesus said before he went to be with God the Father, before, before even the crucifixion, you'll, you'll be my witnesses, right? And before he ascended, he said, listen, go ye therefore into all the nations and make what? Disciples. And, and then he said, but listen, don't go yet. You guys hold back and the Holy Spirit's going to come and the Holy Spirit's going to empower you and he's going to empower you to do what? To be my, what? Witnesses, right? In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. And so they know that when they pray, God, would you give us the power to be witnesses for Christ? They know they're praying in the will of God, and God loves to answer the prayers of his people when we pray in, in his will. First John, the disciple John, wrote this later in his writings. The same guy who was in prison, right? says, Now this is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us, and he grants the petitions we have asked of him. God hears our prayers, and, and, and he heals and he, and he enables us to have our, our, our prayers answered, in this case, to be witnesses for Christ. And how do, they, how do we know that God answered their prayers? Well, in, in this case, um, God chose to just give them an incredible blessing of his presence by shaking the place where they were gathered. Pretty remarkable. But he shook the place where they had gathered. And, and it's been a while since I've looked at that specific word, but I think if I recall correctly, it means literally like an like an earthquake type of shaking, a physical reality of the presence of God. And, and, and they, they had humbled themselves before the Lord. And I believe when God's people humble themselves before the Lord, then the Lord lifts them up in, in His strength and empowers them to, to be witnesses for Christ. And that's exactly what has happened here. They came back not full of a pride and confidence about how they had performed this miracle. They came back and said, listen, God is awesome. God is with us. He's sovereign. And so, God, would you continue to empower us to be a witness, witnesses for you? And so they, they prayed that, and in their prayer and humility before God, then God chose to shake the place and affirm his presence with them. What, a, what an, incredible, an incredible act of God. You know, for us today, I, I, don't think, I don't think we need to be, as a church, woke. Just so you know. And that's, that's for another day, but we need to speak about it. I don't think the church needs to be woke or awakened, but I would say the church needs to be shaken, shaken by the Holy Spirit, to simply walk in the fullness of God the Spirit and walk in the ways of God. If we allow ourselves to be shaken by the Spirit of God and walk in the ways of God, we are going to live in our culture in ways that glorify God and actually bless our fellow man. If we are shaken by the Spirit of God, then, then we'll go to the Word of God. And in the Word of God, our ideologies, our philosophies, our theology, our understanding how to live in a way that glorifies God, glorifies God will not come from the culture. It will come from Christ. It will look different. And it has saving power. It not only has influence that, that can bless people and change people and help people and be a part of, yes, systems in different ways that can encourage people, but it also has the power to transform people because our message, church, is the gospel. Our mission is the, the gospel of Christ, first and foremost. And the gospel gets to the core root of all things. There's many things in our culture that says, well, this is a problem, and this problem is systemic in all things. No, the root of the problem, church, is sin. And the answer to sin is the Savior, and the Savior's name is Jesus. And the good news is that in Jesus Christ, we can have that sin forgiven, that sin erased, and we can have the Spirit of God placed within us. And then as we live by the power of the Spirit of God, and we ask that in filling of the Spirit of God daily, that as God fills us and leads us and controls us, then we walk in such a way that glorifies God, I believe, and blesses our neighbors, and blesses our community, and, and our cities, and, and our states, and our nations, and the globe. The power is in the gospel. The power is in Christ. And we have that message. And we are called to be bold witnesses of that message. My prayer is that God would shake us. 
And sure, I'm not, I'm not against if God ever so chooses to do it in ways that we can literally physically have affirmed the presence of the Spirit of God. Sometimes God will work in miraculous ways like that. Maybe it's individually, maybe it's corporately, where you just know that God is so affirming that He's with us. But even when you don't have that feeling, just so you know, I don't think the church had this, this little physical shaking every time they prayed. Just so you know. I don't think the focus is to ask for that every time we gather. Just so you know. The Spirit of God is mysterious. He's like the wind. We can't see it, but we know that the wind is real because we see we see the papers flying on the page here. We see the, the trees blowing up there uh, to my right. We know the wind is real, but we can't see the wind. But we know that it's real because of the powerful effect it has on the things around us. And we're gathered here together today, not because we can see the Spirit of God or can see God, but we're gathered here today because we know the powerful effect that God has had on our lives, on us individually and collectively as a church because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because of placing your faith in Jesus, the one true Savior, the one true Lord, the one true King. Shake us, Lord, that we might be witnesses for your glory. And to all the nations, beginning right here in Lake Country, come to see the beauty and place our faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the chance to gather and to learn from your scriptures, your holy word that speaks to us week in and week out about your character and your goodness and your ways for us. They speak of how, how you are sovereign and how you reign supreme and we acknowledge you as our great, supreme, sovereign Lord. They speak about how your scriptures guide us in your ways to know what's taking place, even in our own day and time, and some of the answers, the solutions, which ultimately come back to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus, we thank you for being our great King and Lord and Redeemer, who leads us by your Spirit. Thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to be with us, to be among us, and to guide your people, your body of Christ. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you dwell within us. But we also pray that you enable us to ask for your filling daily. That we allow you to control us daily. That we might walk in the ways that glorify our Heavenly Father. Holy Spirit, shake us. And we'll know that we're shaken when we are willing to proclaim and live out the glory of Christ. Among ourselves and among others in our community. Lord, we thank you for giving us a witness and we ask for those who are hearing the witness for the first time this morning or maybe the, the third or the fifth time or the tenth time have not surrendered to the witness of Christ the testimony of Jesus Lord they have placed their faith in the Lordship of Christ and then make that known to testify of it to let it, let it be known to step forward in obedience for example through baptism and through walking in the ways of God to not hold it to themselves but to place their faith in Christ and be born again in the family of God Lord, I pray that for those who may be here this morning that need to respond to the Spirit drawing them to place their faith in Jesus or someone online who's listening to the gospel message to place their faith in Christ. Jesus, you're worthy of our praise and worthy of our honor and worthy of all glory. God, we thank you for the body of Christ. We thank you for how we can be encouraged together as we gather. We pray we've been encouraged today and there's been a a blessing before you, Heavenly Father, as we worship before you. We pray now, encourage us and fill us to go out into our community. To enjoy our day, yes, but to be about Jesus. Lord, we just want to close in thanking you for the grace of mothers. I'm grateful for moms, grateful for future moms. I understand the challenge for those who desire to be moms and have not been able to be moms as of yet. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you bless those those ladies with your grace and your spirit to guide them through what you have in store for them. Your sovereignty, your goodness, your, your holiness that reigns over us as believers is always righteous and just and good for each and every one of us. So bless everyone according to your will and your plans. And we'll give you all the glory. God, we thank you, we praise you. And we love you in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen, Amen. amen. God bless you all this beautiful Sunday.
Till next time.